This is up to Friday. Friday will be as well. Okay. Yeah, it'll happen. So I all right i'm gonna get started since it's uh 8 31 um and uh, we have a lot to go through last lecture we went over frequency response and how to generate a plot of the frequency response so just as kind of as a reminder the transfer function is J H of S. And then uh, that's defined on the complex plane. And then uh, we said that if we evaluate it along the imaginary axis, imaginary, then that's what we actually call the frequency response basically. So the transfer function evaluated at the imaginary axis, the frequency response. We went over methods for sketching out the frequency response as a function of frequency. And then we also introduced kind of the frequency response in a decibel scale. And additionally, so this would be the magnitude of H of S. Oh, J omega, sorry. And then we also went over methods on how to plot the frequency response in the, the face of the frequency response. Um, 
for the exam, uh, we, we said that you didn't have to know how to plot this, but you definitely did need to know how to plot this. Additionally, we kind of, uh, we talked very briefly about the significance of uh, these frequency response plots. Uh, and in particular, the significance is if I have a input, let's say V in, uh, so if T equal to cosine omega T, then the output, this could be a current or a voltage, is just actually equal to the absolute value of H of J omega, or the frequency, the magnitude of the frequency response, cosine omega T. Here, let me just that just to make it more generic, plus B, plus B, plus the angle of the frequency response. So as a result, we can simply just off these graphs, read uh, the value of the magnitude, the value of the phase, and figure out our output for any given input. Now, this is only the steady state response. So it only gives you information about the steady state response. Um, do realize that this is actually the exact same thing you were doing when you were solving phasers. Uh, because when you were solving phasers, you were basically assuming the input was a cosine omega t with some angle. And then uh, you solve the circuit with SS replaced with J omega, and that gave you your amplitude. Well, effectively, that's the exact same thing as solving for H of S and then looking up the value of the magnitude and phase. Uh, the, the main distinguishing feature is that now you actually have the solution for all frequencies versus before you only had the solution for one frequency. Um, yeah, so, but just without getting out of uh, kind of losing track, you need to know how to read both of these things. So read, you don't need to know how to make both of them. You only need to know how to make this one for the exam. Um, so you need to know how to go from an H of S to one of these plots and vice versa. And I think the exam has some pretty good examples of the questions that we ask. So we don't ask anything de that deviates too much from what's already in those practice exams. Uh, so it's gonna be the same flavor. All right, so that's frequency response. So I'm not gonna talk about that more. I just wanted to kind of clarify that I'm not gonna ask you anything special about this approximation stuff that I went over. That was mostly to give you an idea of why this thing works, not, um, but it's not necessary for you being able to generate these plots. Ideally you do understand it, but if you don't, then that's not the priority here. Okay, so today we're gonna actually talk about resonance and second order systems. So this is actually a fairly basic thing. Effectively, all that resonance means is uh, if you have a circuit, when you look at kind of the input impedance to that circuit or admittance, uh, what it means to be at resonance, there's a frequency where all the uh, reactive elements cancel or another way to say that is that there is a, if we look at the the impedance, the equivalent impedance of this, of a circuit, uh, it's gonna be basically a function of omega uh, and uh, here, the J omega. And there, what we call the resonant frequency is the frequency where the imaginary part of the impedance is equal to zero, effectively. Uh, and so what that means is that the, the uh, reactive elements cancel. So if you look at this first circuit here, uh, the input impedance is just basically, because you have a 
inductor in series with a capacitor, it, in terms of the S, it's just S times L plus one over SC or the inductor in series with the capacitor. When you evaluate it in terms of frequency, it's just J omega L minus J over omega C. And then what we would call the resonant frequency is a very specific frequency, omega R, where the imaginary part of Z is zero. And to determine that R, all we have to do is basically uh, plug in omega R here, omega R here, and set the imaginary part to zero. And when we do that, we can actually determine that the resonant frequency for this particular circuit is just one over the square root of LC. Um, what that corresponds to in this particular circuit is that for that frequency omega R, the impedance of the circuit is zero. Uh, so effectively, um, what you will have is exchange of energy between the capacitor and the inductor, but uh, but they both kind of cancel each other out, and so that you get that the impedance is zero. For an RL circuit, you can also find, uh, for a series RLC, you can also find the resonant frequency again. So basically, your input impedance is just the inductor in series with the capacitor, in series with a resistor, you plug in J omega, and then to find the resonant frequency, so this is a very specific frequency omega r, all we have to do is set the imaginary part to zero. And in this case, r is real. And so the imaginary part is just this, and so we just have to set this to zero. And when we do, we get that it's actually one over the square root of LC. Uh, for the uh, for the parallel one, same thing. We just look at the equivalent impedance. In this case, we do it in terms of admittance because it's easier since everything is in parallel. But again, the resonant frequency just means the imaginary part of the admittance or impedance is zero. And in this case, it's just gonna be one over the square root of LC. Uh, is it clear what it means for, uh, what resonant frequency means? So you basically take your circuit, you find the uh, impedance, and then you set the uh, imaginary part to zero and solve for the frequency. And that gives you the resonant frequency. That's effectively all you have to do. Um, so yeah, so here I kind of went over the tank circuit. Uh, yeah, the natural frequency. So da, 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 da. yeah, so I, I guess I'll go over this circuit just to kind of reiterate. So if we look at the impedance here, it's just a uh, C in equals one over R plus one over omega L plus J omega. C. Um, and then to the negative one. So in this particular case, we have that this is actually equal to one over one over R minus J omega L plus J omega C. And then because we need to set the imaginary part to zero, we want the denominator to be real. So what we do is we multiply this by the complex conjugate, one over, maybe I should change colors. Uh, one over R plus J over omega L minus J omega C. Um, and then one over R plus J over omega L minus J omega C. Um, and then what we get is basically that this is just equal to one over R plus J one over omega L minus omega C 
divided by one over R squared plus one over omega L plus omega C, wait, minus omega C, sorry, squared. So I multiplied by the con complex conjugate for the top of bottom to make the denominator real. <laughs> and now um, all we have to do is basically figure out the frequency at which the imaginary part is zero. Is it clear to everyone what I did here? Does everyone understand why I multiplied this by the complex conjugate in the denominator and numerator? Yeah. You said that uh, this strategy is generally easier or doing like the parallel like resistor thing where you multiply ball on top of it and add on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Parallel resistant thing in the multiple. Like Z1 times Z2 over Z4 plus Z2. It's so like parallel. Probably. Well, in this case, there's a C3, so you can't really do that. Oh, is that not one? No, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, but but in general, like uh, the, the thing that I've noticed in the past is that a lot of students come in here and they don't kind of, they haven't been taught this, which is that... And B, A and B can be any numbers is actually equal to A squared plus B squared. So does this look uh, familiar to all of you? Yes. Yeah, so in this case, kind of like you're kind of in a jam because you have imaginary terms in the denominator and you have to remember at the end, we're gonna have to set those to zero. And so we gotta get rid of all the imaginary terms in the denominator. And to do that, this thing is kind of, very important because all you have to do is just multiply both top and bottom with the same thing, but with the sign of the imaginary part switched. And that will basically get you a purely real denominator and a, uh, yeah, and basically in the numerator, you're just gonna get whatever. Uh, but what's nice now is that like we said, to find the resonant frequency, we have to set the imaginary part to zero and now in this particular case, the imaginary part becomes this. Um, and so now we have basically, uh, here. so now we have basically that uh, one over omega L minus omega C divided by one over R squared plus one over omega L minus omega C squared equals zero. And then of course we can multiply in both sides by this term here. And then when you multiply this by zero, you get zero. So this goes away and we're just left with, uh, this has to be equal to zero. And so, so then we get that omega r equals one over the square root of LC as we did in the previous slide. Is this clear to everyone? Um, so as you have noticed for all three circuits we kind of gone over at this point, the resonant frequency is one over the square root of LC that's not the case for all circuits. And in the exam, that won't be the case. So just FYI, um, you will have to solve, set the imaginary part to zero and then solve the circuit. Um, so now I'm actually gonna go over a case where the, wait, uh, imaginary part is, where it's actually not one over omega C, and I think this is it. Uh, yeah, so this particular circuit. So I'm gonna go over a circuit now that where it actually doesn't work out like that. Okay, so what's the admittance as a function of frequency for this particular circuit. So we really just have uh, 
an inductor in series with a resistor. So SL plus R, and all of that is parallel to one over SC. Um, and so in this particular case, we have basically one over SL plus R plus SC is equal to Ys of S. Is this uh, clear to everyone? Yeah, so that's basically the admittance for this particular circuit. Um, and now, now that we know the admittance, which I just kind of wrote here, and then I multiplied the top of bottom by R minus J omega L, R minus J omega L to get this. Now it's asking us to find the resonant frequency. So what do we have to do to this to find the resonant frequency? Yeah, so we have to take this part minus this part and set that to zero. So basically we have to solve the equation J omega C minus J omega L over omega L squared plus R squared equals zero. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. This should be omega R and omega R and omega R because now we're setting the imaginary part to zero. So the J's of course cancel because they're common to everything. And now we actually have to solve this and what did I do here? Yeah, so basically you can move the omega RC to the other side. So then you have omega RC equals omega L over omega r l squared plus r squared. Then you can multiply both uh, both sides by the denominator to get rid of that. So I'm gonna do that. So let me erase this equation here. So if I multiply both of these by the denominator, I'm gonna get omega r squared l squared c plus omega r r squared c equals omega r l uh yeah yeah omega cubed And then this should be squared. Okay, so basically now we have to solve this like cubic equation, but in this particular case, we get that kind of one solution is omega r equals zero. So we have three solutions because this is a cubic polynomial. And then we have to basically find the roots to the quadratic equation, omega r squared, L squared C plus omega R, R squared C minus, minus L, sorry. So you have to find the roots of this polynomial to get the other two uh, resonant frequencies. And here I did it more cleanly. So this is what we had in the previous slide as our main equation. And then after multiplying, after moving omega C to the other side, and then multiplying by the denominator, we got this equation. And then basically once you have your quadratic polynomial, you have kind of uh, two roots and that's where you get that basically omega r is at, once you plugged in into the quadratic equation, you get that omega r is actually equal to this. So that's kind of the the resonant frequency for this particular circuit. Um, 
it's just a lot of algebra, basically. Fundamentally, all we did was set this thing to zero, set the clear to everyone, and then found the omegas for, where that works. So what you really need to take home is uh, the imaginary part of y's of r is equal to the imaginary part of z's of omega r which equals zero. So if someone asks you, what is the resonant frequency? You gotta find either the admittance or the impedance, set the imaginary part to zero and solve for omega, that's it. If you know that, um, I can tell you that you will get far with respect to this topic. That's, uh, and that the rest is just algebra. And I mean, I can, yeah, I really can't do much to, that's kind of something you have to kind of do on your own. <clears throat> okay, so. Hmm, should we talk about this? Yeah, let's just skip this. Uh, okay, so let's go back a little bit now that you've kind of understood what, how to compute resonant frequencies and now kind of why this is important. In particular, um, the reason that this is important is if you, for example, have a circuit. So this is a very basic circuit. So this could be your phone and you're trying to charge it. So you connect it to your little, uh, what is it? Uh, these things that always break the little cable. And then, uh, and then your phone starts charging. Um, and the speed at which it charges is basically depends on kind of how much energy that resistor is receiving, which is gonna be IV basically. Now, in reality, what ends up happening is that your phone doesn't quite look like a resistor. It has all kinds of parasitic elements and it might actually look like a resistor with a capacitor in parallel. And of course, all you wanna do is deliver things to your phone, but then there's all this energy kind of going into this capacitor, charging, discharging, which generates heat. And that means that basically out of kind of what you're getting out of this, not all of it is going into the resistor. And so as a result, the amount of the voltage that you will get through the resistor will be smaller because now you have this capacitor. And so effectively, when you're designing things, you kind of want to get rid of the effects of this capacitor. And so what you want to do is actually stick a inductor in parallel. Uh, uh, L. So that uh, it cancels out the effects of the capacitor. And since you know your input, you just have to design your circuit to have the correct resonance frequency. Um, and so then you kind of basically stick a kind of an inductor or you might not stick it in parallel and then you find out what that inductance is. Now, if you design this properly to be resonant at one, the impedance will just actually be equal to uh, R. And so in which case you will get kind of maximize the energy delivered to your load. So that's kind of the most, the significance of this that when you have at your resonant frequency, you're maximizing kind of the energy to a load. And oftentimes the way you use this in practice is actually to what people would call impedance match, uh, which is basically to design the circuit so that you can get all of these parasitic elements to cancel each other out. Um, None of this is gonna be in the exam. This is just, I'm just trying to give you kind of some of the intuition as to why we're learning this. Uh, you just need to know that resonant frequency, imaginary part of impedance is zero. Uh, but this is basically why we're doing this because at some point you're gonna design a circuit and there's not gonna be any, any way around uh, having some parasitic capacitance. Um, Cause you have to realize that like a capacitor is just two wires in parallel. So if, you, if you're basically designing kind of like a chip 
it's got a, it's going to have a bunch of wires. You're going to connect a resistor. You're going to connect maybe like a little microchip. And then these wires here, because you're pulsing this thing so rapidly, starts to behave like capacitors because they're parallel to one another. And so your circuit, even though you never stuck a capacitor in there, it's going to behave, have some capacitive -like, like behavior to it. And then you're going to be like, what do I do? What do I do? And then you're just going to be like, oh, I'm just going to stick an inductor here and problem gone. Um, so that's kind of why we're talking about this. Uh, because you, when you, when you get parasitic things, you're going to eventually have to find on what, find the right L to get the omega R where you want it to be, basically. And then you just stick a, a component there until the thing works. Um, yeah, that's basic engineering for you. <laughs> just sprinkle capacitors and inductors. And, <laughs> and then when they ask you, uh, like, how did you do it? When they ask you kind of, uh, so what's like your method? And you're just like, oh, well, it works. That's it. <laughs> it's just like, that's my method. It works. Um, yeah, so that's basically it for the resonant frequency. Are, are there any questions on this topic? No questions. Okay, I'm gonna start on next lecture's topic so that Friday we can actually review. Um, start. So next lecture, I'll continue going over frequency and magnitude scaling, but I just want to get started now so that on Thursday I can talk a little bit more about it during our review session. Okay, so frequency and magnitude scaling. So effectively what frequency scaling is, is you will, uh, if you have a circuit, let's say you've designed a circuit like a plus minus, then there's a resistor, a capacitor, whatever, and then maybe an inductor, and then you can have another capacitor if you, whatever. You've designed the circuit and then you basically want a voltage across this uh, capacitor. So you find the H of S and after you've designed it, you realize, oh, the, the customer, wanted the, the the frequency to be 100, not 10. And then you go on panic mode because now you have to redesign the whole circuit. Well, it turns out that you don't. So you can actually what's called frequency scale this circuit, which is just a recipe to basically take this circuit, replace it with a new circuit, new, that now has a transfer function H over KF. So in this particular case, if you wanted the whatever happened here at 10 to now happen at 100, so when I plug in S of 100, all I have to do is choose a KF of 10, and then that would give me the circuit now frequency scaled. Uh, so effectively, all this frequency scaling is is just a way to change components to maintain the shape of your frequency response, but effectively shift the x-axis. That's that's it. Um, and then I'll, I'll tell you in the next slide exactly what you have to do to this, to this circuit to actually frequency and magnitude scale it. So that's what we call frequency scaling. Now, let's say you wanted the circuit to have an output kind of a frequency response that was 10 times bigger than what you actually designed for. And you're like, oh no, now I gotta redesign the circuit. Well, there's actually another recipe that allows you to go from a transfer function that looks like that to uh, a new transfer function that looks like this. And that recipe is what we call magnitude scaling. So effectively it gives you a heuristic to change the individual components values so that you go from a frequency response that looks like this to a frequency response that looks like that. That's what this is all about, basically, that's it. 
So first I'm gonna tell you the recipe and then we'll go over, I guess, some examples and I'll tell you why this works. Um, okay, so the recipe is this. So if you have a circuit that is kind of are composed of resistors, capacitors, inductors, and so on, and, uh, and the transfer function for that circuit is H of S. Now, if you replace each of the resistors, inductors, and capacitors, so this is the new circuit, with new components, with different resistances. So now that your resistance will have a resistance of R times Km, your inductance will have an inductance of L times Km, divided by Kf, and your capacitance now will be capacitance times Km divided by Kf. So I'm just gonna show a little simple example. Let's say I have this, R, and then C. I would replace this circuit with uh, plus minus, Km times R, so that's the new resistance. And then uh, C over Km, Kf. These two circuits will be related in that if this one has a transfer function H of S, let's say for the voltage across the resistor, then this new circuit will actually have a a transfer function, uh, depending on the type of transfer function it is, equal to one of these four. Um, so effectively, if the transfer function is volts over volts, so in this particular case, since I have a voltage source and I said that the transfer function was for VR, it is volts over volts, then it's going to be uh, H of S divided by KF, if it's current over current, it's again H of S divided by Kf. And if it's voltage over current, or if it has units impedance, unit Z, then it's just Km times H of S divided by Kf. And then uh, if it has units one over impedance, then it's one over Km. Now, there's actually a very easy way to remember this, which is that your magnitude scaling every every impedance by Km and things that are one over impedance by one over Km. And so as a result, your output would be scaled by Km and one over Km respectively at the units are impedance and one over impedance. Um, so now for why this actually works, I'm gonna give you uh, sketch as to why this works. And I hope that this kind of makes a little bit of sense. Uh, so I'm just gonna draw a circuit here really quick. Uh, so we have plus minus the resistor, a capacitor so that the impedance is just one over SC. Um, and then I have the inductor, it's just gonna be a, uh, Oh, yeah, SL. Now let's just say that I found that my H of I found H of S, and now I want to go and replace this S, right? By S over KF. So I'm gonna call this. So all I have to do, right, is just wherever I see an S just replace it with S by over KF, and then I'm gonna presumably get uh, the same transfer function, but with now with all the S's replaced by S over KF. So I'm just gonna call this S prime for a second. So I'm gonna design a new circuit, which basically uh, has plus minus R capacitor one over S prime C S prime L. So would any of you 
would any of you, so this is the, the, the exact same circuit, okay? All I did was replace the S's with S primes. Would any of you disagree with me that the transfer function for this circuit is gonna be? Okay, okay, so we're all on the same page here. Okay, well, what is S prime? S prime is just S over KF. And so if I plug in it here, then it's just gonna be S KF. And then same thing here, uh, S over KF. So effectively, if I wanna go from a transfer function that looks like this to a transfer function that looks like this, I just have to take my inductance and replace it with uh, KF over L over KF, take my capacitance, uh, replace it with C over KF, and I have to leave my resistance alone. So that's basically why this works effectively, because all you're doing is you're replacing all your S's with S primes, and then you that tells you what the new inductance and capacitance should be. In the same way, if I take this circuit, mm, this is a bit more complicated, but let's see if it goes through. Um, yeah, this, this depends on the, on the input and the output, but basically if I take a circuit and I take the equivalent impedance and I just multiply everything by three, right. Or by some number, if I take all of the resistances and I multiply by some number KM, KM, Km. So if my input is voltage and I multiply all impedances by Km uh, and my, so input is voltage, uh, wait, did I do this right? Yeah, let's just see, voltage. And then my output is, uh, so it can either be voltage or current. If my output is a voltage, right? Uh, if I multiply all the resistances by Km, and let's say my output is the voltage across the capacitor, would that change the the uh, the way the my output at all? So here I'll I'll I'll, I'll kind of write out what the current going through the circuit is. V equals uh, so, so the I out, right, will be equal to V in divided by ZL plus ZZ plus R, which is CX. So if I multiply all three of them by, by uh, three, what would happen to my current? becomes three times smaller. Okay, so let's start with this thing. So that means that the current is actually one over Km. Now, if I were to take my, now if I wanna find a voltage of any of these, so if it's either CC uh, or CL or R, what happens when I multiply all components by three? Does it change the voltage out? So let's say the output is the voltage. So if I'm looking at the voltage across the resistor, it would be R times this. So imagine I multiplied all of these by Km, would it change the voltage out? Yeah, same thing for the inductor, same thing for the capacitor, CC and CL. Um, and so as a result, if I have volts per volt, because whatever happens in the numerator happens in the denominator, nothing happens. So by similar arguments, if your input is actually a current source and you have an output at current source, nothing will happen. And then you can also show that basically uh, 
if your input is a current source and your output is a a uh, voltage source, then you have a rescaling of KM. So that's how basically this whole table comes about. So if you replace your inductor with L over KF or C over KF, you get that your transfer function gets replaced by S over KF. And that's because you effectively just did that little S prime tick trick. And if you multiply all of your components by KM, uh, yeah, so then you're gonna get that the voltage over voltage and current over current don't get changed, but the voltage over current gets becomes times KM and the current over voltage becomes one over KM. Is this uh, clear to everyone? Okay, so that's kind of what we call voltage magnitude, magnitude scaling. So here I'm actually going over some examples. So here's kind of a VN or VN. And so we want to magnitude scale it. So let's say we designed this thing with three and five ohms. So now we want to magnitude scale this so that we uh, have bigger components that are more realistic. And the output is the voltage across the inductor. Um, so let's hear we're multiplying by KM equals 1000 so that we can use bigger components. And when we look at the response in both cases, the voltage out, which is our output, is the same. Now, if we had chosen the current out, I, L, it's actually 1000 times smaller. And that's because V over I, Vn over IL is one over impedance. And since the KM factor was 1000, then we get a 1000 times uh, smaller current. Now, th th this is of particular importance because engineers love tables. Um, and so what you will see a lot of times is you have a CAN circuit that people have designed and you don't wanna just use it at one megahertz, you wanna use it at hundred megahertz. Instead of redesigning the circuit, you basically use the table to shift the frequency of your circuit and kind of change the response without actually changing the topology. Uh, so th this is, seems kind of like, okay, why are we doing this? But it's mainly because of that, because a lot of times you will have some very canned application, but it might not exactly fit what's already been designed. And so you just wanna modify that circuit a little without doing a lot of work. And this is kind of a way to change those whole huge components, basically. Um, yeah, so we'll continue talking about this on Friday and we'll probably talk a little bit more about the three topics that were discussed this week. Um, are there questions about this at this point? Or I think I'm done with the phone.